Dr. Raj here with Beyond the Pearls. Today's topic is, what's causing this uveitis? This has been a very common question I see on internal medicine board exams and the USMLE. So let's talk about this 32-year-old woman is referred back to you by her ophthalmologist. Why? She, a few weeks ago, was presented with pain and redness of her right eye, and she was diagnosed with uveitis. Anytime they tell you the diagnosis in the question, is that a good thing? <laughs> Definitely not. But not to panic, let's go back and read some more history. She was begun on topical uh, cortical steroids with some improvement. Other than some mild injection of her right eye, she has no other complaints. Her physical exam is otherwise unremarkable. Her ophthalmologist says she needs a systemic disease workup. Which of the following is most appropriate initially? And the key word is initially. Is it gonna be an MRI of the head? Should we get a chest x-ray? What about uh, herpes simplex virus serology? Or maybe some double-stranded DNA? What are they implying? Does this patient have lupus? So when I look at these choices, I mean, I think we're gonna be a little too invasive going straight for an MRI. What are we looking for? Is there any indications that this patient has herpes? I mean, don't get me wrong. Can herpes be associated with uveitis? It can, but throw me a bone. Give me a physical exam finding. I don't think that this is gonna be the way to go yet. So double-stranded DNA. The question is, can autoimmune diseases and let's be honest, can lupus cause uveitis? The answer is yes, but if I wanted to work up lupus, would I get a very specific test like double-stranded DNA? Probably not. I'll probably start off with an ANA. So the right answer is chest x-ray. And all you guys are thinking, why chest x-ray? What disease is Dr. Raj thinking about? And if I were to say this is a 35-year-old African-American female, what would we think about? You got it sarcoid. So sarcoid can definitely present with uveitis. So what is sarcoidosis? It's a systemic disease of every organ in the body. It can affect the eyes, such as posterior and anterior uveitis. It can definitely affect the heart. It can affect the skin and give you lesions like erythema nodosum. And it can affect the lung. And in fact, 90% of people with sarcoid have lung involvement. To give you some syndromes that are not very common, but you may want to think about for board examinations, there's Lofgren syndrome, which gives you the combination of erythema nodosum, arthritis, and hyaluronidinopathy, and a more rare syndrome that's more subacute to chronic, known as Hertford Waldenstrom syndrome. When we talk about how to be diagnosis, well, Beyond the history and physical examination, it's all about tissue. You want to get tissue minimally invasive. We usually do a bronchoscopy. And when we biopsy, what do we look for? non caseating granulomas. But remember, there are other diseases also that can give you non caseating granulomas, such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis, the briliosis, and maybe some infections. And that's why it's very important to rule out things such as fungus and tuberculosis. When we talk about treatment of sarcoid, not everyone needs treatment. You definitely want to treat if they're going to be symptomatic. Things like involvement of the lungs, people who are having cough and shortness of breath. Those are going to be indications that you want to treat with steroids. And anytime we start steroids, are there going to be bad side effects? The answer is yes. You could have a cushionoid presentation. You could have osteoporosis, poorly controlled diabetes, poor wound healing. You want to stop the steroid as soon as you start it. And sometimes it's not that easy. And that's why we use many steroid sparing agents. And I want to spend some time talking about those steroid sparing agents that we use in sarcoid. Things like methotrexate. What I want you to know for the board exams is it can be toxic not only to the bone marrow but to the lungs. How do you give the dose? You can give it oral, weekly, or you can give it as an IM injection. And when I talk about my sarcoid patients, I usually start around 7.5 milligrams weekly. And please don't forget the folic acid. Another drug that we use is known as Imuran, which is going to be a drug that can have toxicities to the bone marrow. And that's why we want to make sure that people can metabolize the drugs. And we may consider ordering something known as TPMT, which is gonna be a enzyme that breaks down the toxic metabolites of Imuran. 
Another drug that we use sometimes is known as Arava. This is kind of like the brother of methotrexate, and we usually start at a 10 milligram dose. And once again, it is going to be something that can cause diarrhea and abdominal pain also. If you have a lot of skin lesions, we think about using a drug known as Plaquenil, especially we use that in lupus patients with skin lesions, and of course, our sarcoid patients. A key pearl for the board exams will be consider checking a G6PD level because this drug has known to be caused hemolysis. One of the hot topics in medicine right now are these TNF inhibitors. There are many on the market and there are some mixed results, but we do use a few of them when we talk about treating sarcoid patients. On the last two, I wanted to mention something known as MMF, which is going to be an oral drug that has limited data in sarcoid, but it's oral and it does help take off those steroids. And last but not least, Dr. Raj is beyond a pearl for you, is a FDA approved drug for sarcoid known as Acthar. And you know what Acthar stands for? ACTH. It's the hormone that go goes ahead and produces cortisol, but it also has other effects on things known as melanocortin. And we use this drug in patients with sarcoid, we have lung disease and patients with uveitis. So please put that in the back of your mind. I'm Dr. Raj giving you some beyond the pearls about what's causing this uveitis? Well, the answer in this case is sarcoidosis.